Hey, welcome to NASA 360. I'm Jennifer Pulley. Let's get this show started right off the bat. What do you think is the highest profile and hardest job at NASA? Well, hands down, it has to be being a member of the astronaut corps, right? I mean, come on, definitely. At any given time, there are less than 145 astronauts in the corps, which means only the best and the brightest get the chance to fly. And let me tell you, you certainly have to be one of the best and brightest to keep up with the demanding training that comes with the job. So, what's this training like? Well, today on NASA 360, we're going to spend some time finding out about it. We'll also see what it takes to get our astronaut crews ready for a flight. Johnny Alonzo flew down to JSC in Houston to check it out. Hey, how's it going? I'm Johnny Alonzo. Today I'm at the NASA Johnson Space Center here in Houston, Texas. Now, if you know anything about NASA, then you pretty much know that some of the most important testing at NASA happens here. Some of the coolest training facilities in the world are located right here. So today, let's talk about some of the facilities and some of the people that train here, all right? Let's go. But first, let's think about this. Even though we all know that astronauts are some of the smartest and best trained people around, we only measure their success when they're in space and tend to overlook their training years. But let me tell you something, astronauts train for years, years, way before they ever get into space. Why? <laughs> well, the answer is pretty obvious. If you add up all the cost of getting a craft into space and everything else that goes along with it, guys, that adds up to a lot of coin. And money's only a small consideration compared to NASA's number one concern, crew safety. So yeah, we definitely want the best people in the world in charge of our spacecraft. So how do they do it? You know, train for space missions. Well, astronauts can't learn on the job, right? They gotta learn everything backwards and forwards before they get into space. So that means lots of practice and realistic mock-ups and simulators. A ton of that testing takes place right here in the Space Vehicle Mock-Up Facility. But around here, most people just call it Building 9. Building 9 is where astronauts, engineers, and others learn everything they need to know to help them operate equipment during a mission. This facility houses Space Shuttle Orbiter Trainers, an International Space Station Trainer, a Partial Gravity Simulator, the new Orion Crew Capsule Trainer, and much more. I met up with astronaut Al Drew. Tell me more about Building 9. Okay, so this is Building 9 Johnson Space Center. Right. These are, we have one-to-one -one scale mock-ups of everything we have flying in space. Okay. It looks like an oversized you know, you know, child's playpen you know, these, with these things like toys, toy strewn every which way. Right. Uh, you've got the robotics training down at this end of the building. You've got all the shuttle crew training on this side. And then you've got the space station. Again, a one-to-one mock-up of the space station over at the far end over here. Sure. So it just depends on what training you're doing that day, uh, we'll decide what's part of Building 9 that you wind up in. Well, let me ask you a question. Um, how realistic are these mock-ups? The mock-ups are incredibly realistic. Are they? Uh, after working on these for about seven or eight years before I got to go fly, okay. you know, I had the same you know, question. How realistic are these mock-ups? Yeah. And we don't get to get on the shuttles until we're really assigned to a flight. Of course. And so I'm on there about a month before launch on the Space Shuttle Endeavor working on this, you know, working in lockers, and I kept having to tell myself, okay, this is the Space Shuttle Endeavor, this is not a Building 9 mock-up, so treat it with more respect than we do the mock-ups over in Building 9. Really? You know, don't, don't scratch the paint on them. So, I mean, we have all the Space Shuttle mock-ups here, right? But when the Space Shuttle ends, I mean, how will this building be used? Okay, well, obviously take out the Space Shuttle mock-ups, but this whole other third of the building over the far third that you're looking at back there still has a space station mock-up. Oh. And of course the space station will be flying well into the next decade. Right. Uh, we also have the Constellation Program, the Crew Exploration Vehicle. Those will, instead of becoming developmental um, engineering simulators, they'll become training simulators. And we'll be right back in here with our uh, Constellation vehicles, which is going to be more like an Apollo capsule because where it was going, there weren't a lot of runways on places like the Moon and Mars. So, right. so we can come down under, on jets or just under parachute back here to Earth. And the whole thing is to have a dress rehearsal to get ourselves smart about being on another heavenly body again because think about it, it's been 72 it was the last time we had any person uh, leave any boot prints on the Moon. It's going to take decades to get there, so our first step is to go to the space station with this new capsule. Um, once that's done, uh, we'll eventually push off and go to the Moon explore the moon and hopefully stay there. It's like we do with the space station. We'll have continuous presence on the moon like we've had a continuous presence in space since 2000. Uh, once we've gotten smart about working and living on other planets and dealing with different gravity levels and, 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 and the travel, eventually, who knows, 15, 20, 25 years from now, building that body of knowledge that doesn't exist right now to go push out to Mars. We're walking up into the upper deck of the space shuttle. Uh, it's got two different levels to it, so you've got the mid-deck down below us, which seats three, right. and the top deck here, which seats four. And this is the part we use mainly for all the flying when we're doing landing, launching, and doing rendezvous. Mainly designed for zero-g, so there's no graceful way to get in and out of here when there's weight <laughs> on your body. That's all right. Look. Yeah. <laughs> nice. 
Yeah, when they talk about more switches in the space shuttle, here's where that comes from. Apparently. He has a switch for everything in here. All right, so, you know, here at the facilities, I mean, you know, you get prepared for a lot of things, but tell us about some of the things you don't, that you can't prepare for. Okay, yeah, we, when we get to space, we're prepared for the technical part of it. Right. You know, we know where the switches are, we know where our scripts are, we know how to deal with emergencies. But what you really can't get used, get prepared for is just the emotional effect of being in space. We've gone that big big rumble and fire and you, you ride up into space and now we're weightless and that's kind of cool. And then the first time I had to go look out the window and I can see the curvature of the earth. You can see the limb of the atmosphere. You see the, the profiles of thunderstorms that were you know, thousands of miles away. And of course, it's this inky black, this void of space out there beyond us. And the first thought that came to mind was, man, we are not in Kansas anymore. And there's the Earth going by at 17,000 miles an hour. So I was like, no, there's no, there's no going back on, hey, 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 Commander, I've got second thoughts about this. Yeah, I left something at home. Yeah, we're committed. We're up here and we're doing this. The other thing is that you think in terms of two dimensions and one gravity. You, know? you talk about a house being you know, 3,000 square feet, but if it's a 10-foot high ceiling, you've now got 30,000 cubic feet, and you don't think about that because so much of that's above you. Now, you've been down to that downstairs in that mid-deck. There's seven of us down there trying to get meals at the same time. You know? It's like a phone booth. And finally, on about the third day, I had this epiphany. I just pushed off on the floor, did a half flip, landed on the ceiling, just kind of sat up on the ceiling and had my Cheerios upside down. And of course, everybody's down the floor jostling each other, and I had the whole volume up there to myself. It was like I'd just <laughs> gone to a whole other room. And, but it was the, but, so those are things that you just can't ever train for. You have to go up there and experience it. Al, I can't thank you enough, man. Oh, my this pleasure. was a lot of fun today. Great having you aboard with us. Thank you so much, and it's, it's obvious you really enjoy what you do. What up with the cake? Let's start this thing up. <laughs> we'll get this thing cranked up. Let's go. <laughs>
and the shuttle will do a pirouette maneuver and rotate 360 degrees. Okay. Well, this is where the two astronaut and cosmonaut oh. are shooting high-res digital photos of the bottom and top of the orbiter so we can send that down for analysis. Oh, cool. For check all the tile. <laughs> and then back up this way, this is kind of like the living quarters and the kitchen. Uh, your water dispensers and everything are up here. Uh -huh. This is a basic table. We don't have it really decorated out because we don't serve meals in here. Shit. But this actually folds out. It has slots for food cans, Velcro everywhere. Nice. Um, so you can stick your utensils. And it's a nice place for the crew to gather and actually get together at the end of the day and have a meal. Last but not least <laughs> yeah. is the sleeping quarters. There's two sleeping quarters in the service module. This would be one. You'd have a sleeping bag behind you on the wall here. Okay. Uh, you got a small light up here. You'll have a table for your laptop computer so you can check email. Wow. And uh, you know, we actually have a window where you can look down and look at the Earth if you want. So two of the astronauts or cosmonauts will live here. Sure. One lives in the U.S. lab in what we call the TESS, which is about the same size as this, but it's just built into a wall rack unit. We have different ways of training to repair tiles. We have metal covers that we can actually put over damaged tiles and screw down. Oh, you can neat. see the pattern here. Right. There. If we have severe damage like you see in these really deeply cratered tiles, yes. we have a, a, now an ablative called STA-54 that we created here at NASA. And we basically go out and fill this. We have oh. two ways to fill it. We have little caulking guns if it's a small damaged part. And we have a big gun if it's a big part sure. uh, that we have to fill. This will burn about halfway off during re-entry, but it still gives us the thermal protection to keep the orbiter right, safe. Right, enough to keep it going. And then we have to also look at the problem is, you know, say you have a small gouge in a tile. Okay. Okay, first thing our people have to do is analyze where it is, what's underneath it, and in a worst case scenario, can this damage the orbiter? Because to put a crew member in a suit, go out and do a spacewalk, and sometimes even go underneath the space shuttle, where we can't even see them, uh -huh. could be very dangerous for the crew member, for starters. Number two, if we miss and we bump them into the shuttle, we could do more damage than we had to begin with. So that has to be taken into consideration. Yeah. You know, what is the benefit if we just leave it alone? Would you get damage like this? Oh, we get damage like this on almost every flight. Little pieces of ice, pieces of foam fall off, um, strike the uh, orbiter as it's going into ascent. And really the first two minutes are what's really important because the air is so thick it can move little pieces of foam or debris at a high rate of speed. Once you get past about two minutes, um, the air is so thin, even if something flakes off, it's just gonna kinda bounce off the tile. So what are you showing us next? Well, this is our 1G trainer of the Orion capsule. Okay. And this is gonna be the replacement for the shuttle. Uh, I don't really call it a replacement for the shuttle. It's gonna follow after the shuttle. All right. um, this will be our replacement vehicle to go to the space station hopefully go back to the moon, and then maybe someday go to Mars. We have several seat configurations for this. We have a four person, which would be to go back and forth to the moon, and we have a six person configuration to go back and forth to the space station. Now this will launch on top of a rocket, and you're only gonna be in this for a couple of days, You know, two days to the space station, two or three days to the moon, then down to the surface. Right. So it doesn't have to be that big, and it doesn't need that huge cargo bay that the shuttle has, because we're huh. not hauling space station up. We don't have the seats in because right now we've been looking at where to store everything. And oh. when the seats are in, you can't really get to anything under the floor. So once you get in space, you fold those seats up uh -huh. and you have access to the storage compartments. I if we step you. over here, well, I'll show you what's called the aft bay trainer. Okay. And this will show you where we have basically the, out, the outer pressurized segment, which is out here. Right. And then the inner pressurized segment. So now we are inside of the Orion capsule without the floor and without the outer walls. Oh. So this is your floor level Okay. Now. So you got the seats out and you're in space. Well, here you've got a lot of your avionics and controls, life support systems that stay here all the time. Here, right there. But you have to store harnesses, bags and bags of food, <laughs> you know, for days, yeah. days for six crew members. And this allows us to get in here and figure out where we're gonna put all these bags, all this stuff. In there in there, but it doesn't make us have to tear the seats out every time. So right. we can do our storage configurations here in just a, you know, plywood and aluminum mock-up sure. that works perfect, you know, that was built for us, instead of having to tear that apart when we want to get that ready to do a suited evaluation with astronauts. Right. Tim, thanks so much for your time. Hey, great to have this you. This was a lot of fun. Always welcome here at JSC.
Okay, so let's talk about how astronauts train for weightlessness. All right, I'm hanging out here on Earth and uh, I'm experiencing 1G, which is normal for everyone. It's uh, just basic Earth gravity. But when astronauts travel in space, uh, they're weightless, right? Well, not exactly. If anything, they're in a constant state of free fall. Here, let me try to break it down for you. There is a big misconception out there that astronauts in space are floating because they're weightless. But it's actually not true. If an astronaut is orbiting Earth, let's say 100 miles over our heads, they do weigh a little less than us, but only by about 5%. That means if an astronaut weighs 100 pounds on Earth, they would weigh about 95 pounds in orbit. So why do they seem weightless? Well, the answer is pretty simple. They're in free fall, like that weightless feeling you get on some roller coasters. Or maybe you've seen people in free fall when they skydive. Well, without the wind rushing by the skydiver, they might feel as if they were floating. Well, astronauts are basically doing the same thing as the skydivers, but instead of falling toward the ground, they're actually falling around the Earth in a constant state of free fall. Because astronauts are so high up and are traveling at over 17,000 miles per hour, they seem weightless or like they're floating while falling toward the Earth. So that's the basic idea. But how do astronauts get that type of feeling back here on Earth? Well, there's no magic machine that can get them that exact feeling, but one way of doing it is through the Reduced Gravity Research Program flight. What's that? Well, that's basically getting an airplane to dive steep enough to create that reduced gravity feeling. You know, weightlessness. Here's what actually happens. As the airplane climbs to about 32,000 feet, the pilot quickly dives to a steep angle. As the plane falls, it produces about 25 seconds of weightlessness. Every object and person not strapped down will float around the cabin. Then the plane levels off and climbs back to a higher altitude. Then it falls again for 25 seconds. A typical flight will generate 20 or 25 minutes of weightlessness chopped up into little 25 second segments. If you're careful and do a lot of planning, you can get tons of stuff completed in these little 25 second segments. You may have seen this in the movie Apollo 13. A lot of the weightless scenes look real in that movie because they were. The movie studio built a complete model of the Apollo 13 spacecraft and placed it inside the reduced gravity research program airplane. They filmed the weightless scenes 25 seconds at a time. And by the way, this plane has a nickname. It's called the Vomit Comet because so many people are hurled during the repeated up and down motion of the jet. Man, we just had lunch. I am not getting on that thing. <laughs> Look, other than climbing on board an airplane to get reduced gravity training, there is another cool way to train. Would you believe at the bottom of a huge swimming pool? Yeah, astronauts train at the world's largest indoor swimming pool called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratories here at JSC. Now, I'm not joking when I say huge. I mean, this tank holds 6.2 million gallons of water. It's 200 feet long and 40 feet deep. Astronauts train for spacewalks on full-size replicas of space station modules and can spend about 10 hours underwater for every hour they spend walking in space. Let's check it out. But our goal here is to take whatever test subject we have, make them neutrally buoyant so that wherever we put them in that pool, they're going to stay in that position. Oh, they're great. not going to float up, they're not going to float down. Yeah. And they're not going to pitch up and they're not going to pitch down or roll to the side. So we actually have a process that we go through here. When we put the astronauts in, we allow them to pull themselves to the bottom. We're going to put them in a horizontal position and we're going to put foam and weights in various parts of the spacesuit uh -huh. so that he is neutrally buoyant. So whenever we stick him at a 45 degree angle, Canon 45 degrees, he's going to stay there. Just, oh, like if, just like he was in space. Let me ask you something. Obviously it's a space station, right? What else do you have here besides that? Well, we have a space station mock-up. And right. you see that our pool's not quite big enough to hold the whole space station. That's how big this, space, this spacecraft is. Huge. Um, we also have in here, we have the, the space shuttle. The space shuttle is right down here in the corner. You can see that's the payload bay of the shuttle. We don't care about any of the pressurized parts of the shuttle because we're going to concentrate on those parts that are used for spacewalks, and that's the payload bay. Well, let me ask you then, so if someone would, was wearing a spacesuit mm -hmm. in the water, I mean, is it exactly like the spacesuit that they would have up in space? It's very similar. They're, they're downgraded spacesuits. We're not going to have all the electronics that they have in what they call the bliss or the backpack. Okay. Of, the, of the spacesuit. We're going to have uh, mock-ups of those. Um, and all of our systems that are typically in like the backpack, those are going to be land-based systems. So our guys are actually running with umbilicals. And if you look at the pool, you can see the umbilicals running across the surface. Yeah, right. If you were to pull those up, you'd have a big white fish at the end of it. <laughs> and it'd be an astronaut. Is it almost like being, you know, experiencing weightless in the water? 
from our perspective, it looks awesome. It looks yeah. like they're just out in space. Yeah. But you know what, from the astronaut's perspective, he's feeling the effects of gravity. Whenever we oh. flip him upside down on his, you know, what we call an inverted position, heads down position, right. all the blood is running from his legs into his head. So he's feeling all that, you know, his, oh, <laughs> all that pressure in his head. Yeah. Um, he's also feeling the weight of his body on his shoulders. Um, so we actually have limitations on how long we'll allow the crew persons to run in the inverted operations, um, just to, to avoid any sort of injuries that we may have there. So I know that you have a couple astronauts in the pool. Talk to me about uh, some of the other divers that you have. Well, we typically have five support divers for each astronaut okay. in the pool. Um, we're going to have two safety divers, and safety divers are there to watch the astronaut and make sure that you know, they're not picking up any cues that the astronaut may be in distress. We also have a utility diver, and a utility diver is a person that is following the crew person and sort of assisting them. And then we have another type of di diver, and that's called a float cam diver. And a float cam diver is there to make sure you get good close-ups of what the astronaut's doing. So we have a total of five divers that are actually following two safety divers, two utility divers, and one float cam diver that are following each crew person that's in that pool. So Mike, do the astronauts and the divers uh, worry about getting a you know, case of the bends? Well, actually we try to address that. We're breathing nitrox. Both our, our scuba divers and our astronauts are breathing nitrox. Okay. Um, as far as the scuba divers, um, whenever you breathe nitrox, it's going to bring that depth of the pool from 40 feet down to about, or up to about 17 feet. So you never really get into the case where you've got to worry about any kind of decompression sickness in here. Okay. There are some other concerns that we may have, but as far as the bands or anything like that, we're going to be all right. Hey, so what's going on now? What are, what are they doing over there? Well, from a time, it looks like the session's about over. So what they're going to do is they're going to bring the crews over to what we call the donning stand. It's the, you can see the yellow straps yeah, coming out yeah, of the water. Totally. They're actually going to attach the crews onto that donning stand. They're going to use the crane to lift them out. Ooh, can we go downstairs and take a look at Let's this? Let's go take a look. Let's go, man. Let's go. Come on. Right now what they're doing is, is uh, pulling the crew out of the water. Okay. You'll notice the crews actually attach the structure uh, so that they don't fall off. They're actually latched on and then we have a safety strap also on there. Oh yeah, I can see that. I can see it. So as they get them up above the, the height of the deck, they're going to swing them in over the deck and lower that stand down on the deck. So right now they're taking all the peripheral stuff out. There's a mini cam they took off and taking the tools off. Right. I'm um, trying to offload that suit. Yeah, this must be the rough part for the astronaut. He's like, get me out of this thing. I've been yeah. in here for six hours, you know? Mike, this was wild, man. Thank you so much for the great tour of uh, the MBL. Hey, it was our pleasure. All right, man. We'll Come on back out and visit us. We most definitely will. So as you can see, there certainly is a lot each astronaut has to learn before they're ready to fly. Well, what about you? Are you up for the task? You know, NASA's always looking for qualified applicants. That's it for this episode. For Johnny Alonzo, I'm Jennifer Pulley. I'll catch you next time on NASA 360. Hey, that's it for this episode. For Johnny. <laughs> Catch you next time on NASA 360. They're coming to take me out. Um, I'm hanging out here on Earth and I'm experiencing 1G. You know, it's, uh... Look. Two. <laughs>Tell me, I mean, there's a lot going on here. What's going on in this pool? I've already told you twice what's going on. <laughs> They're weightless, right? Well, not really. What, you don't get me? What, you don't understand? Hey, how's it going? I'm Johnny Alonzo. Two. <laughs> Which is, uh, you know. <laughs>